Uh, so our next speaker will be Caroline Terry from Ohio State, who will speak on higher order generalizations of stability and arithmetic regularity. Uh, Caroline, please. Thanks. Um, so thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a project that's joint with Julia Wolf. So I'll start with um, some background. Um, and it'll be sort of more of a big picture talk versus the talks in the seminar. So hopefully people will still find that interesting, even if you attended the seminars. So uh, the first kind of general question uh, is what is a regularity lemma? So I think a lot of people are familiar with uh, Semaretti's regularity lemma for graphs, but it's also kind of um, thought of as sort of a general result, general type class of results. So in particular, a regularity lemma is a decomposition of a mathematical object into a structured and quasi-random part up to small error. Okay, so the idea is that you can study different mathematical objects using this kind of class of theorem by changing what you mean by structure and quasi-randomness. Um, so, and, and the, structure, the structure notion you pick and the quasi-random notion you pick are, are tied together via the proofs. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so, okay, the most well-known example is Samaretti's regularity lemma for graphs. So this says that for any epsilon greater than zero, there's a bound M depending only on epsilon, so that every sufficiently large graph has an echo partition of its vertex set into at most that, that big M number of pieces, and so that almost all pairs of pieces from the partition are what's called epsilon regular. Right, so we're not, I'm not gonna define epsilon regular because it's not really necessary for, for the rest of the talk, but it's a notion of saying that it looks kind of like a random graph. So the idea in this theorem is that the structured part of the theorem is the vertex partition. into So a partition of the vertex set into pieces of all roughly the same size, that's the structure. And the quasi-randomness part is is the fact that in between most pairs, it looks like a random graph. It's epsilon regular. And then the, the error part is, of course, the fact that not all the pairs are regular. You're allowing the fact that maybe some of them aren't regular. So your modulo, like the structural decomposition, you're decomposing your graph into pieces that look like random graphs. All right, and so this is um, another regularity lemma by Green in 2005. So, so it's so, and I wanted to give you, you this example in this form just to indicate that um, you can prove this spirit of a result in for different types of objects. So this is a decomposition of a function rather than a graph. So given a function from f p to the n into the interval minus one one, you can decompose the function as a sum of three three separate functions, so that the first function is structured. And what that means is, is that it's actually going to be a constant function on um, the cosets of, of, a, of a subgroup, basically. So the structure is related to the, the cosets of a fixed subgroup of bounded index. The F2 component is what's called quasi-random. And in this case, that gets measured using Fourier coefficients. And then in the third case, the F3 is just small. So it, it's kind of small everywhere. It's small in the L2 mark. So, you know, it's not necessary to, to know exactly what this says, but it's just kind of um, to, to know that like the style of theorem can be used to decompose objects other than state graph. Okay, so, um, right, so, so in this slide, I've got a kind of two tables. And so in the first table, I have, um, regularity lemmas for higher arity relations. Um, so so the, the higher arity regularity lemmas uh, were developed kind of in the 2000s by a bunch of people working in extremal combinatorics and additive combinatorics. So I've listed their names up there. And so in the left-hand column we have, okay, if you want to have a regularity lemma for graphs, which would be in a binary relation, this would be the first row. And then, the structured part, as I already said, would be a partition of the vertex set. The no quasi-randomness notion would be epsilon regularity, which has an equivalent, an equivalent name, um, which I'll denote dev2. And the two is to denote that it's like for pairs. Um, and then there's an error part, regular pairs. If you want to do ternary relations, so this would be like a, 
three uniform hypergraph, you change the notion of structure. So instead of decomposing just the vertex set, you partition the vertex set and the, you know, and the cross B. So you partition the vertices and the pairs of vertices. And then you have some other notion of quasi randomness where the two and the three there are to denote that there's like a binary and a ternary component to the quasi randomness. Okay, so again, it's not important to know what all of these things mean. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for the, for the class of theorems here. Um, and instead of re regular pairs, you get something called irregular triads. And then similarly, as you go up in the hierarchy, it, things kind of happen analogously. Um, so on the other hand, there's also, there's kind of a, a corresponding hierarchy in the arithmetic setting. And in the table, I'm going to be writing it for some subset A contained in FP to the N. And so this is kind of ideas of Gowers and then regularity lemmas proved by Green and Tau. So, um, so if you want to understand just the relation like X plus Y in the set A, so it's a binary relation. And then the regularity lemma for that type of relation would correspond to like the co coset structure for a subgroup. So cosets of subgroups, which is also referred to as linear structure. And I'll be talking about that in a little more detail later. And then in this case, the notion of quasi randomness um, is, is the something is controlled by something called the U2 norm, the Gower's norms. And that's um, can also be phrased in terms of the Fourier coefficient. Um, and then, okay, there's some error component. Um, and then if you want to study like a ternary sum, sum graph relation like x plus y plus z is in the set A, then the structured part will be not just coset structure, but coset and coset structure and quadratic structure. And then you'll use one level up in these in this you know hierarchy of Gower's norms. So the quasi-randomness will come from the U3 norm. And then as you go, as you go down, you'll add you'll add an, you'll add one more degree in the structure, and then the type of Gower's norm you use will go up by one. Okay. So I guess the, the idea of this is to give you a picture in a sense for like in the in the hypergraph setting, you know, the, stru the structured part of the partition, you're required to decompose, um, you know, the vertex set and then the vertex set and the pairs, the vertex set, the pairs and the triples, et cetera, et cetera, as, you, as the arity goes up. And in the, in the arithmetic setting, what happens is instead you sort of use higher degree polynomials in the structured component. So the goal of this picture, or the goal of this project was to understand um, stability in the context of the charts from the previous slide. And in particular to understand like essentially ternary or essentially higher order analogs of stability by understanding the role of stability in these types of theorems. Okay, so what I have is basically, it's just analogous tables where, um, now I'm, I'm assuming I wanna have like, impose some kind of combinatorial constraint on the very left-hand column so that something interesting happens in the error column. And the reason I wanna do this is based on the fact that if I plug in stable for the graph relation, by Maliaris and Shellock, I get no irregular pairs in the regularity lemma. And so the first result Julie and I proved is that if you then insist X plus Y and A is a stable graph relation, you can also get, you'll also get no error in the, in the, in the last column in the arithmetic setting. So, um, right. So this was kind of like where the picture we had as we were sort of starting this project. And the goal was to like fill in the question marks, more or less. So we want to understand, so what would you expect to put in the left-hand column in the question marks, you expect to put some combinatorial configuration that's like stability, but different, something that's essentially ternary in nature. And then in the right-hand column, you expect to put something like the error is doing something special. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more, like in more detail, what, what, ended, up, what ended up happening in this project. So I'll give you, um, a little bit more of a formal setup for this. So we'll talk about hereditary graph properties. Um, so hereditary graph property is a class of finite graphs closed under isomorphism and induced subgraphs. So, um, and it's a well-known fact that if you have a hereditary graph property, there's a universal theory in the language of graphs so that property H is exactly the 
class of all finite models of a theory. Okay, so graph theorists like to call this a hereditary graph property, but it's really just the class of finite models of a universal, fixed, incomplete universal theory. Um, and then we'll say that a hereditary graph property is stable if the edge relation is stable in every model of the theory. So by compactness, that means there's like a, a single K so that the edge relation never has a K order property in any model of the theory. All right, so now what I have, what we have here is a characterization of stable hereditary graph properties in terms of the behavior of the irregular pairs in the regularity limit. So the theorem says that if you have that a hereditary graph property is stable, if and only if for all epsilon there's a bound m, so that in any sufficiently large graph in the property, there's a little m at most this bound m, big M, and a partition of the vertex set into parts v0 up to v little m, so that v0 is small, and all of the other all the other parts have the exactly the same size, and all of the other pairs are regular. So, so pictorially, we have, if this is V, we have a small error set. And then we've got all these other pieces that have all the same size. And these are all, all these pairs are epsilon regular. So, okay, so the one direction of this is folklore, and the other direction is uh, the Maliara Shellock, like stable graph regularity. Um, so I know some of you have heard me say this already, but I want to kind of emphasize this again. So this is equivalent to saying that there's a regular partition with no irregular pairs. And the way that you get that partition from, from this partition is you take the V0 and you just break it into evenly sized pieces and you put those pieces into the other parts. Um, can I ask? Uh, can I ask you, what do you mean by stable? I mean, so in the right-hand side direction, for example, if you have a sparse relation, as far as I understand, it's always epsilon regular, right? Already. Yeah, but, so so because it's the, because we're on the left, like we're, we're looking at the whole hereditary property. So um, if you have a, let's say you have a very sparse graph in the property, which is unstable. Yeah. So there's like, but that would mean that, a, somewhere there's a very large half graph, even if the overall graph is really huge. But then because it's hereditary, the yeah. half graph will also be in the property. Oh, I see. Yeah, so the, so, so working in the hereditary I, setting is what allows you to have a characterization. I see, yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right, so, uh, okay, right, so, um, so right, so we can obtain a partition with no irregular pairs from this. And then, um, but I like, I like to state the theorem in this way now because um, what it's saying is that in this formulation, you're allowing yourself possibly to have irregular pairs, but they all have to touch this set V0. So the idea is that all the irregular pairs are involved involving this one set V0, which is a unary set. So you can think of the Irregular pairs as being constrained by a distinguished unary set. All right, so I think that kind of one of the main ideas that came out of this project is that, um, you know, if you want to understand kind of the general role stability is playing in the irregularity lemmas, it's not necessarily about having no irregular pairs, but about constraining the error part of the regularity lemma using lower arity sets. Okay, and in the arithmetic setting, that that translates into using lower degree sets. So a corollary of that observation is that if you're in a very large arity setting, there's lots of arities, you know, so let's say you're in arity five. Well, there's a lot of arities below five. There's four, three, two, and one. So there's possibly lots of different ways to constrain error sets using lower arity. So you may end up with several different notions of stability. All right, so I want to give you a somewhat precise statement of our theorems in the hypergraph setting. So I'll give you a few <clears> definitions. Um, so we're going to be working in the setting, the ternary setting, where our, all our results are for ternary hypergraphs. 
Um, so a three graph is a structure in the language with a single ternary relation, which is symmetric and irreflexive. So this is the same as a, as a, three, uni a three uniform hypergraph. Okay, so the order of the variables doesn't matter and it only holds on distinct triples. So a hereditary three graph property is a class of finite graphs closed under isomorphism and induced sub three graph with just an induced sub three graph is just a model theoretic substructure. Um, and as with the as with hereditary graph properties, any hereditary property of three graphs has a corresponding universal theory um, axiomatizing it. So again, we're just looking at really just looking at universal theory. All right, so this is a very informal statement of a regularity lemma for three graphs. Um, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief that we're not going to be going into the full details of this. Um, so, so this is, I'll attribute this to Frankel and Rodel, but there were a lot of people involved in developing these theorems, which I listed on the previous slide. So roughly this says that for any hereditary three graph property H, the following holds, every sufficiently large three graph in the property has a regular decomposition of bounded complexity with a small number of possibly irregular triads. So there's several words here that I haven't told you the meaning of, um, including like regular decomposition, complexity, and irregular triads. So I'm not going to define everything um, in full rigor, but I'm going to tell you a bit about what do the decompositions look like and what is a triad. All right. So, so the decompositions will be something I'll call a TL decomposition. And so the idea, the rough idea is you're going to partition D and you're also going to partition D cross D. So a TL decomposition P for a set V is a partition. So it's two, it has two pieces, two pieces of information. One, it partitions them. So it's a partition V1 up to VT of the vertex set. Okay, so first, first it tells you a partition of the vertex set. And then for each i less than j, it partitions the Cartesian product vi cross vj. So for each pair here, it also gives you like partitions of the pairs in between them. So we'll let p vert denote the vertex partition and p edge denote the partition for the pairs. Okay, so in here, I'm using the word edge as kind of a generic word for pairs. So the t, right, and the t is for the complexity of the partition is the T and the L, which is telling you essentially how many parts are in the partition. So T is the number of vertex pieces and L is the number of parts you partition each pair into. Um, so, then a, so then instead of a regular pair, we're gonna look at something called a regular triad. So a regular triad is a tripartite graph um, of the form, okay, so a tri okay, so a triad will be obtained by taking three sets from your, uh, let's see, maybe I'll draw the picture. So it's obtained by taking like three sets from the vertex partition. So I'll take like a VI, a VJ, and a VK. So the vertex set will be VI union VJ union VK. And then choosing between each pair, one of the edge colors. Okay, so then I'll choose one edge color, like I guess PIJ alpha, P, J, K, beta, and P, I, K, gamma. All right. And so the, the triad is this three-partite graph here, whose vertex set are these, these sets, and whose edge sets are these edges, these pairs. So, the, so instead of a regular pair, we were looking at a regular triad, which is a graph, the tripartite graph. Um, okay, and so the rough idea about what it will mean for a triad to be regular is what is the following. So um, given a three graph H on the same vertex set, we'll say that the triad is regular with respect to the ternary hypergraph. If, okay, two things happen. First of all, you need the, the, the pieces of the, of the pair partition, like the P's, these all need to be highly regular as graphs. So individually, like all three of these pairs need to look like epsilon regular pairs for a very small epsilon. 
And then secondly, the edges of the ternary edges of H need to be sort of uniformly distributed with respect to the triangles made in the tripartite graph here. So, so it roughly means if you pick a bunch of if you pick, pick a bunch of triples who are also triangles in here, and you compute how many how many of them are also ternary edges in the ternary hypergraph, that number won't change much depending on which collection of triangles you take. So the, the full, you know, the full blown definition is, is rather technical, but I think this is this is the idea of what it does. So it's like in a in a partition in a regular partition of a graph, the kind of units, the regular pairs are like you take two unary sets. And if you when you go to the turn, if when you go to hypergraphs, instead of instead of two unary sets, you're going to take three unary sets and then three binary sets. So you can go one level up. All right, but I think the most important thing to remember from this slide is only that the, the, the regular triads come associated with three set three, like a VI, a VJ, and a VK. All right, so, and the, re the reason that's important is that that plays a role in how we did, how we, in our definitions for how to constrain the error triad. So the error triads are the ones that fail to have that good, like, uniform distribution with respect to the ternary edges. All right, so there's, there's, okay, so once you start thinking about this, you're in the ternary case, there's sort of three natural ways to constrain the error triad. So the most, the most obvious thing to, to define would be to say that, well, there's no error triads. They're all regular triads. So that's what we call having zero error. So if H is a three graph and P is a regular TL decomposition, we say it has zero error if there's no irregular triad. Um, on the other hand, we'll say that it has binary error if there's a small set gamma of pairs from one through T. So in a TLD composition, the T is the number of VIs. So there's a small set gamma in Chi choose two, so that every irregular triad has vertex set of the form VI union VJ union VK, where one of IJ, IK, or uh, JK is in this set gamma. So the idea for that is that like in this picture, you have a small, you know, you have a small number of pairs like this, and all of the irregular triads have to touch one of the pairs. So the, there's some small binary set constraining the error triads. And then the, the last way to do it, or the last way that we found, is what we've called linear error, which says there's a small set sigma of triples of ind indices. From T, so that every regular triad's vertex set has the form VI union VJ union VK for some IJK and sigma. Um, so you might think, okay, so, so two comments here. The first comment is that I will tell you later why it's called linear error. Okay, so it's, that's not supposed to be obvious right now. Um, and the second comment is that it may seem like every hypergraph should have a partition whose error set can be constrained in this way, but it turns out that that's not true. All right, so it's easy to see by definition that having zero error implies having binary error implies having linear error. Okay, so there's kind of they're kind of going in order from most restrictive to least restrictive. Um, so then you can say that a hereditary property admits zero binary or linear error, respectively, if all sufficiently large elements in the property admit regular decompositions with that type of error, respectively. So, um, so what we're doing is like we're, we're identifying the very final column in the chart, which had to do with constraining the error set, and then we're going to look for the combinatorial properties in the left hand column. Are you okay? Push the dad, give it seven. Seven, really, dad, give it. Shamshid, your mic is on. All right, so uh, from these three definitions, we naturally get three problems. So, um, so we'll go, I'll go through a little bit about what's known. And so I, I wanna also say that our, our main goal was kind of to get at the right, um, 
the right problem for, for proving the arithmetic analog of our stability theorem. Okay, so so in, in, a, in, in sort of investigating all of this, we're also keeping in mind um, the arithmetic setting. So the first problem was to characterize all the hereditary properties with zero error. And so we have partial results in this case. And in particular, we showed that it's really related to a notion of binary stability. So we were really looking for something essentially ternary. And it turns out that if you put, this is such a strong restriction that you'll wind up with a notion that's kind of essentially binary. So it's related to um, weak regularity and to results by Ackerman, Fear, Patel, and Chernikov, Starchenko, if you're familiar with their work on regularity limits for stable graph, stable hypergraphs. Um, and so we give, we give a conjectured answer there too. Um, all right, but you know this, so, but it turned out that that problem wasn't really exactly the problem we were looking for. Um, problem two is about binary error. And this is also open. So we prove several partial results and we give a couple, I think, key examples in our paper. Okay, and in particular, we show that all three of these problems are distinct from one another. Um, so that leaves us with problem three, which turned out to be the right problem to prove, like in terms of the, the arithmetic analog. So in the arithmetic setting, the goal would be to control the error set using lower degree sets versus lower arity. And that's what this ends up corresponding to, and which is why it's called linear error. So I'll be explaining that um, in a minute. So we give a complete characterization in this of this problem, we completely solve this problem, and, and this is the problem that dovetails with the arithmetic setting. So I'm going to tell you the answer now. Um, so this is what we have called the functional order property. So I'll, I'll draw a picture. So I wrote, I wrote the definition for, for a hypergraph, but um, you can turn it into a definition for a formula in the obvious way. So um, we say a three graph H has the LFOP. So the F, yeah, FOP stands for functional order property. So if there are A1 through AL and B1 through BL, so I'll draw this at the same time. Okay, so, you're, so these are fixed. And then for every function F from L cross L into L, you have a sequence C1F up to CLF such that something holds, such that AIBJCKF is an edge if and only if J is less than or equal to F of IK. So in the picture, what this means, so I'm gonna draw like the adjacency cube of the relation here. So it means, okay, if I have AI and CKF, so I find where these meet and I plug, I plug IK into the function and I get a value up here. So I get some F of IK. And then I take this over and everything below that point, I put in the hypergraph and everything above, I put not in the hypergraph. So the, so the idea is that the function F is giving you like, the graph of the surface in this in this three dimensional matrix, and you put everything below the surface in the relation, and everything above the surface out of the relation. So, um, so this is the definition that okay. This is what we decided is the LFOP. It has several like recharacterizations um, as well, uh, but this is the one that turned out to be kind of the most useful for what we were doing. All right, and so there's a way of seeing this as a generalization of the order property. So if you kind of do the natural thing to make it a definition called FOP1, you end up with the order property. So in particular, a graph has the L order property if only if there are A1 through AL. Caroline, can I ask a question? Um, in the other property, there's only um, one quantifier, namely exist. And here you have two quantifiers. Can you make well, it into no, one quantifier no, definition? No. Because there's only finitely many of these functions, so you, you, I'm really describing a very large ternary. I'm really describing one large existential 
but I would need to do, but it's, it's exists, you know, exists for each app. So you would just write, you would need to write that out by hand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Of course. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, you, but that's a good, that's a good point. It, it's a complete, it's just an existential thing. Okay. Which is, which makes sense because it's going to characterize hereditary properties with certain, certain qualities. Okay. Because it's, so it's negation is universal. All right. So, right. So the point of this comment with the fact is that um, there's a lot of different ways to like write down the order property that are all equivalent. And when you go to generalize them into higher arities, they kind of bifurcate into a whole zoo of different things. So this is one of them. All right. So our main theorem in the hypergraph setting is that um, this characterizes when you have the linear error. So a hereditary three graph property admits linear error if and only if there's an L so that no H in the property has the LFOP. So the, so having the LFOP is like being, being unstable. So this is saying that you admit linear error if and only if you're like stable in the no FOP sense. Um, okay. So, uh, right, so that's the main hypergraph result, but I, I kind of also want to tell you a little bit about the arithmetic result that dovetails with it. So I'm going to switch gears slightly and talk a little bit about the arithmetic setting. So, um, so for our results in this setting, we're going to work in um, groups of the form f p to the n for p a fixed prime at least three and n a very large number. So you think of n as being enormous and p is like some small fixed prime compared to n. All right. So then a linear factor in fp to the n is a set of vectors r1 up to rk from the group, uh, which are linearly independent. Okay, so a factor is just a set of linearly independent vectors. And to each such set, I can associate a linear map from fp to the n into fp to the k defined by um, saying the following. So on an input X, you output the K tuple whose you know, first coordinate is R transpose R1 up to R transpose RK. So, so in other words, you're taking the dot product of X with R1 up to X with RK. And the reason this is called a linear map is if you were to like sit down and write this out, each of the coordinates here would be a linear pawn. So um, the fibers of the function we'll call the atoms of L. So um, in particular, there will be P to the K of them. And the elements, um, the, the, the atoms of this factor are the cosets of the subspace, which is F inverse of zero. So if you look at the things that get sent to zero, those are the things whose dot product with these K vectors is zero. That's always a subspace. And so, um, so if you take the pre-image of zero, you get a subspace and the other atoms are just the cosets of the subspace. So this is why I was writing linear slash coset structure because there's this correspondence here. Um, and the complexity of L is just the number of vectors in L. And because they're linearly independent, the number of atoms is always P to the K where K is the complexity. So this is just a fancy way of describing a coset partition of fp to the n. And so the reason I made this definition is it makes it, it, it makes for stating our group theorems like a little more succinct. So I'm going to state um, our stable regularity lemmas. So these are our first results. Um, so I'll just make one more definition. So if G is a finite group and A is a distinguished subset, and P is a partition, then we say that the partition is epsilon atomic for the set if for every part P in the partition, the density of A on P is within epsilon of zero or within epsilon of one. So that's this first, this first bullet. All right, so it's, in other words, it's saying that for every piece in the partition, it's either like almost disjoint from A or almost contained in A. And then on the other hand, we'll say it's almost epsilon atomic for A if almost all of the pieces have that property. So, so that the goal is like in practice, this P is going to be one of these factors. 
So we're interested in like approximating sets using cosets of a subgroup. Okay. Um, so we'll say that a linear factor is epsilon atomic for A if the, if the atom decomposition is. And so, so basically, remember, a linear factor is just going to give you a partition of the group into the cosets of a single subgroup. And so if that's epsilon atomic for A, it means the density of A on each coset is either very close to zero or very close to one. Okay. So now we can, I can state our, our theorem in just a stable setting. Um, oh, and I forgot to tell you what stable means. Okay, so a, a subset of fp to the n is k-stable if the relation x plus y in A is k-stable. Um, so our theorem says for any epsilon greater than zero and any k greater than or equal to one in prime p, there is an m so that for all sufficiently large n, any k-stable subset of fp to the n has a linear factor L whose complexity is bounded by this, this number m and which is epsilon atomic for A. So it's saying you can approximate A with a coset decomposition of the group with no error cosets. So all the cosets will look like they're almost contained in A or almost disjoint from A. Right. Okay, so I also, all right, so, so that, that's sort of a starting off point for our new results, but um, I also wanted to mention that there was a lot of work that came out of came subsequent to, to Julian and I's first theorem, um, the one on the previous slide. And I've highlighted two of these papers in red because, so this is work with Gabe Conant and Anand Play. And, and so we get very good results in, for arbitrary groups um, using infinitary methods and using model theory. And so the reason I brought this up is because the, the techniques and ideas in these papers are, are, are related to the work of Ludi and his co-authors. And so that, that works very important in what happens, especially in the, in the second paper. Okay, so, so I guess the one point of this slide is that very, really interesting model theory is connected to this problem. All right, so, but I wanna tell you, I actually wanna tell you the theorem. So um, I'm gonna tell you about something called a quadratic factor. Um, so the idea is we're going to have a decomposition for, for sets where we allow ourselves not just like linearly defined sets, but also using like higher degree um, objects. So a purely quadratic factor in Fp to the n is a set Q of symmetric n by n matrices with entries from Fp. And any such set Q is associated to now a quadratic map from Fp to the n into Fp to the Q given by the following. So on an input x, it outputs x transpose m1x up to x transpose mqx. So if you were to sit down and like write out this matrix multiplication, you would find that in each coordinate, you would now have um, quadratic polynomials. So that's why it's called a quadratic map. Right, so we'll call the, again, we'll call the fibers of this map, the atoms of the fact, or the, yeah, the atoms of Q. All right, so that's a purely quadratic factor. And then we'll call a quadratic factor something that has a linear component and a purely quadratic component. So a quadratic factor is a pair LQ, where L is a linear factor and Q is a purely quadratic factor. And the atoms of that factor will then be obtained by intersecting the sets of the two, the two factors. So the atoms of B are the sets of the form L intersect Q, where L is one, is from the purely linear factor and Q is from the purely quadratic factor. So as usual, like these L pieces, these are all cosets of a subgroup. And this is something else that looks nothing like that. All right. Um, the complexity of B will be L comma Q where L is the size of L and Q is the size of Q. All right. So the, the complexity bounds how large this set, this set of atoms can be. So in particular, you know, the size is at most p to the l plus q. Sometimes it could be smaller. Uh, oh, right. So I guess, are there questions on that before I? So um, we're going to prove, a, so what we proved is a structure theorem for sets without the FOP. So we say that a subset of FP to the n 
has KFOP if the ternary relation X plus Y plus Z and A has the KFOP too. So it's this, if you can encode this, this weird configuration in there. And notice that we've moved from instability. So, okay, I didn't write the definition of a stable set, but that's a definition in terms of X plus Y in the set. And now we're looking at X plus Y plus Z in the set. So as we, we're, we're talking about the degree has gone up, but so has the arity of the relation we're considering. All right, so then our theorem says the following. For any k epsilon and omega, there's a bound D so that for sufficiently large n and a, a subset of fp to the n, if a does not have the k fop2, so if it's like n fop2, then there is a quadratic factor B of complexity LQ such that the following holds. So the first bullet says that the complexity LQ is bounded. So if you sum up L plus Q, you, you're at most this constant D. So that means the number of atoms in the factor is bounded by P to the L plus Q in particular. Um, we can also make it have high rank, which is a technical assumption that you want for various reasons, but which you guys can, you don't have to worry about right now. Okay, but you can make this as high as you want. And then importantly, B is almost epsilon atomic for A. So it's a partition of the group into these weird pieces that are defined using these linear and quadratic maps. And almost every piece has density close to zero or close to one with respect to the set A. So up to small, there might be some small number of error atoms, but the rest of them are like almost contained in A or almost disjoint from A. All right, and now the most important part of the theorem is this third bullet, which tells us about those error, those possible error atoms. Okay, so, um, so there may be error atoms, but they're going to be constrained by the purely linear structure, the, the one degree lower structure. So formally, there's a set sigma contained in just the, the purely linear atoms of the components of the factor of small size and such that for every atom in, in, the, in the big factor in B, if if B is not epsilon atomic with respect to A, it has to have the form L intersect Q, where L comes from that set sigma. All right, so every B in the factor looks like this for some L and some Q. And this is saying, if it's an error atom, like if it's not one of the density zero or one atoms, then the linear part has to come from that sigma. So all of the error atoms are contained in a small number of purely linear so, so you can, we're constraining the error set with a lower degree object. So here, instead of arity, we're thinking about constraining it with lower degree object because we're in this arithmetic setting. All right. So in this case, we say that B is almost epsilon atomic for A with linear error. Okay, so this is, this is where the name is coming from. Okay, so in the hypergraph setting, the FOP characterizes the properties with the linear error set. And in the arithmetic setting, this we've shown that if the set doesn't have the FOP, then it has this decomposition whose error set is constrained by the linear part of the factor. All right. So I think, uh -huh. so right, I wanna say just a few words about the tools that go into that theorem. Um, so kind of the first main thing you do when you go to prove the theorem is you use another theorem we proved, which is about sets of bounded VC2 dimensions. So the VC2 dimension is like the one level up higher arity analog of VC dimension. So we proved that if you have, if a set has bounded VC2 dimension, then it can be approximated by quadratic atoms. So so the theorem for those sets looks exactly like the previous theorem without the bullet about constraining the error set. So we first, you know, so first you apply that theorem. To prove the theorem about the VC2 dimension, that requires a bunch of tools from additive and extremal combinatorics. So in particular, we use the quadratic arithmetic regularity lemma, counting on the free graphs and other kind of techniques. All right. So we had to, so that's kind of where those tools come in in a serious way. Um, and then, okay, so once you have this, so, so right, so, the, so you kind of, okay, so you prove that theorem, and then when you go to prove the FOP theorem, you apply that theorem, so you get this kind of auxiliary structure result, and then you move to like a, a like reduced structure in like an auxiliary group, 
it's almost like a, it's almost it's like it's not really a quotient fruit, but it's kind of like has that flavor. And then you Let apply. Just, you, uh, sorry, Caroline, I just uh, point out that time ran out a, a couple of minutes ago, so you can finish, you can wrap up, oh, but uh, we should uh, um, aim oh. to end. Oh, it was 45 minutes. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. All right. So in any case, we apply a stable regularity lemma in this auxiliary group. Okay. Uh, here are some further directions. Um, some of them are, we have partial work in progress, but there's a lot of open problems. Okay. So apologies for going over time. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? You, you mentioned you had a conjecture for something equivalent in the linear case, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, oh, I forgot the terminology exactly, but you mentioned the conjecture at some point. Uh, there, Unary case, maybe. I forgot the 